Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Bible Study, a plain and simple book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study through the entire Bible. We are in the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. And um, being the length of this book, um, let me kind of reiterate some of how Isaiah is, is prophecy. Now, in some cases, when they, we have a book like this, sometimes the chapters, and, and I say that very loosely because the, the chapters, headings, and then the verse settings are not reliable. But sometimes what you may have is a collection. In other words, it, it, it's even though a lot of the book is in narrative form, sometimes when you come to these prophecies, um, you may have a collection of prophecies strung together. Uh, we'll see that mostly when we get to the book of Daniel. The last six chapters <coughs> are, are a string of visions and prophecies strung together over many years in Daniel's case. But anyway, here in Isaiah, uh, you'll see it somewhat. Now, the prophecies follow sort of a format not necessarily in order, but you see God pronouncing his judgment on Israel. In other words, well, let me back up. You see God pronouncing his their sins, okay, their sins. Um, spelling out with their sins, condemning them for their sins, and then warning them to repent and then warning them of the impendent judgment and then telling and then prophesying of the restoration uh, his future plans and purpose for Israel okay and then you also see the what's called the day of the Lord used and the day of the Lord is the day of wrath so the day of the Lord will be the, the day of wrath against Israel, the day of wrath against the nations. So another thing we, we will see in these writings, especially the major writings, is God prophesying the judgment of the surrounding nations, their sins, the surrounding nations. And then the prophecies of the coming of the Lord, the millennial reign of the Lord. And then Isaiah is going to give the, of us give us some uh, insight into Satan's or Lucifer's judgment. So let's get to chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. And um, this is where we left off at. All right, so Isaiah chapter 3, and it says, uh, Observe this, the Lord of hosts is about to remove from Jerusalem and from Judah, Judah every kind of security. Now, what's interesting, we, will, we really will see how this plays out in the book of Jeremiah. But another thing is to note that notice where their security comes from, not in the the, the 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 might of their army, but notice from God himself. So he says, the Lord of hosts is about to remove from Jerusalem and from Judah every kind of security, the entire supply of bread and water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the fortune teller and the elder, commander of fifties and the dignitaries, the counselors, the cunning magicians, the necromancer, I will make use their leaders and the unstable will govern them. The people will oppress one another, man against man, neighbor against neighbor, youth against, and the youth will act arrogantly, the youth will act arrogantly towards the elder and the worthless towards the honorable. Kind of interesting one of the signs of judgment 
is you see the the unruliness and even the children. Notice he says they will act arrogantly towards the elder. I say that because certainly we can see that in our society today. Verse six. A man who even sees his brothers sees his brother in his father's house saying, You have a cloak, you be our leader. This heap of rubble will be under your control. On that day he will cry out saying, I am not a healer. I don't even have food or clothing in my house. Don't make me the leader of this people, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, because they have spoken and acted against the Lord, defying his glory presence, glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them, and like Sodom, they flaunt their sin, and they do not conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Now you remember the prophecy he, he spoke of. He spoke against Sodom and then turned around and called Israel Sodom and Gomorrah because they acted like Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, what you see the prophecies here is that the sinful behavior of Israel was no different. No different than Sodom and Gomorrah. So you remember Sodom and Gomorrah in, in Genesis chapter 18 and 19, where God overthrew them. The, the picture we see, the arrogance, the, 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 how they just had no regard for decency. Uh, they wanted to, the, all of the town men surrounded Lot's house and wanted to have sex with the two angels. Now, whether they realized they, ain't, they were angels or not, but it still showed the, uh, the, 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 the flagrancy of their sin. How they got there was the abundance, okay? Now, Ezekiel will testify to that. Uh, verse 10, tell the, tell the righteous that it will go well for them, for they will eat the fruit of their labor. Woe to the wicked, it will go badly for them. For what they have done will be done to them. Youths oppress my people and women rule over them. And my people, your, your, your leaders mislead you. They confuse the discretion of your path. So you see the total breakdown of society. Men who should be the leaders, the head. Notice he said even women and youth are standing in their place. Verse 13. The Lord rises to argue the case and, and stands to judge the people. The Lord brings this charge against the elders and, and leaders of his people. You have devastated the vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your house is in your houses. Why do you crush my people, grind their face and grind the faces of the poor? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Now I want you to again notice that God continually um, mentions the mistreatment of the poor. I just want you know, just want to keep that in mind. Verse sixteen, the Lord also says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, walking with their heads high, and seductive eyes going along with prancing steps, jingling their ankle bracelets, the Lord will put scabs on the head of the daughters of Zion. The Lord will shave their foreheads bare. On that day, the Lord will strip their finery, ankle bracelets, headbands, crescents, pendants, bracelets, uh, veils, headdresses, ankle, jewelry, sashes, perfume bottles, uh, amulets, signet rings, nose rings, festival robes, capes, cloaks, purses, garment, linen clothes, turbans and veils instead of perf now um I, I have to kind of say this a lot of the old school pentecostal holding this use this verse of scripture to say that women shouldn't wear pants jewelry and, and makeup um but if you're going to say that you have to go and say turbans veils linen clothes garments okay <laughs> verse 24 
Instead of perfume, there would be a stench. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of a beautiful styled hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothes, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword. Your warriors in battle. Uh, then her gates uh, will lament and mourn. Desert, deserted, she will sit on the ground. Now this is chapter 4, verse 1. On that day, seven women will seize one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and provide our own clothing. <coughs> Excuse me. Just let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. Now, again, so this is a picture of how society is kind of dismantled because of the sinful behavior of, um, um, of the people. Okay, in other words, the men would be fallen by the sword. Um, verse 2 says, On that day, the branch of the Lord would be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land would be the pride and glory of Israel's survivors. Whoever remains in Zion and whoever is left in Jerusalem will be called holy. All in Jerusalem who are called, who are called, I'm sorry, all in Jerusalem, all in Jerusalem who are destined to live, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the blood guilt from the heart of Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning, then the Lord will create a cloud of smoke by day, glowing a flame of fire by night over the entire site of Mount Zion, over the assemblies, where there will be a canopy over a canopy uh, over all of the glory and there will be a booth for shade from heat by day and a refuge of shelter of storm and rain first uh chapter 5 verse 1 says i will sing about the lord i love the one i love a song about my loved one's vineyard the one i love had a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Now, the, the imagery here about the vineyard, okay, the imagery about the vineyard. So keep this in mind when you see other images in Scripture, understand what the vineyard is. So the picture is the Lord, and then Israel is his vineyard from which he gathers his fruit. Verse 2, he broke up the soil, cleared of his stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded worthless grapes. Now let's stop for a moment because if you read the Gospels, you will find Jesus using this exact imagery. Okay, this exact imagery. In fact, one parable where he says, you know, he's even talking about this, the, 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 the vineyard not yielding the fruit. And then basically saying, um, um, I think in his parable, Jesus says, you know, the, 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 the servant says, hey, you know, I'll tell you what, let me, let me dig around because the, the vineyard owner was already saying, I'm going to tear it down. I'm going to clear it. He said, well, let me dig it around this year. Um, in fact, I should, let me find, let me see if I can find this parable. Because uh, I know I'm kind of butchering it here. So let me paraphrase it. In other words, Jesus tells the, 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 the parable, parable about the, the owner coming and for three years seeking fruit and finding none. And then when he says, okay, I'm going to tear it down. Then the, the, the servant says, let me dig around it for this year and see what we can come up with, okay? My point is, again, when at, when Jesus is was speaking this language, when Jesus was speaking this language or his parables, so keep in mind that his parables um, came right out of the Old Testament. And the idea is that they're able to understand these parables they're able to understand because they are familiar with the language of the Old Testament. All right, chapter three. 
So now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that uh, than I did? Now, it's kind of interesting to me. I'm not going to get into it, um, how Calvinists, this contradicts Calvinism or Reformed theology since, according to them, God already decrees. And what God decrees must come. So if God had decreed for Israel to prosper and to bear fruit, they should have. Okay, so that's enough of that. But, um, but I, I say that only because I don't get a chance oftentimes when you're doing teachings on these different theologies, you know, it, it would be too exhaustive to go and, uh, you know, find every passage of scripture that contradicts. So I take a little liberty here. This is a good example of this right here. God is asking, what more could I have done for my vineyard than I, uh, than I did? He says, why, when I expected a yield of good grapes, did it yield worthless grapes? Now, I will tell you, what I'm about to do to my vineyard, I will remove its hedges and it will consume, it will be consumed. I will tear down its walls. It will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or weeded. Thorns and briars will grow up. I will also give orders to the clouds that the rain should not fall upon it. But the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, uh, the plant he delighted in, he looked for justice, but saw injustice, for righteousness, but heard the righteousness, uh, heard the cry of righteousness. Um, so again, you see, and I'm going to kind of do this as a, more of a trivial, tr trivial kind of a Bible study housekeeping here. Understand God just identified the vineyard as Israel. So when Jesus is talking about the vineyard, we know he's talking about Israel. Okay. Verse 8. Both to those who add to the house and join field to field until there's no more room and you alone are left in the land. I heard the Lord of hosts say, indeed, many houses would become desolate, grand and lovely ones without inhabitants. For a 10 acre vineyard will yield only six gallons and a 10 bushel of seed will yield only one bushel. So you kind of have to be a farmer to understand that. I don't. Okay. Uh, in terms of the measurement side, verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning and pursue in pursuit of beer, who linger into evening inflamed by wine, and their feet, they have lyre, um, at their feet, they have a lyre, harp, tambourine, flute, and wine. They do not perceive the Lord's action, they do not seek, see the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile because they lack knowledge of her, they lack, they lack knowledge. Now, you remember in Hosea it says, my people die for lack of knowledge, meaning the knowledge of God's word, the, 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 the knowledge of right and wrong as God has prescribed in his word. Um, therefore, my people were going to exile because of, because they lack knowledge. So he's predicting the Babylonian invasion. Uh, her dignitaries are starving and her masses are parched with thirst. Therefore, Sheol enlarges its throat and opens its wide and open wide its enormous jaw. Now, Sheol is referring to the grave here, the grave itself. Okay. Um, he says, and um, therefore she enlarges his throat and opened wide his enormous jaws and goes down and goes and down goes Zion's dignitary, her masters, her crowds, and those who carouse in her. Humanity is brought low, man is humble, and hearty eyes are humble. But the Lord of hosts is exalted by his justice, and the holy God is distinguished. By righteousness, lambs were grazed as if their own uh, uh, lambs were grazed as if in their own pastures, and strangers would eat among the ruin of the rich. Woe to those who drag wickedness with cords of deceit and pull sin along with carps, card of ropes. To those who say, "Let him hurry up and do his work quickly, so that we can see." 
let the plan of the Holy One of Israel take place so that we can know it. Woe to those who call evil and good, no, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, to substitute bitter sweet for sweet bitter. Now this verse here, we see this played out in our politics every day. So I'll just leave it at that. But notice he says, when you call evil good, in other words, now your sin, this is what Israel was doing, calling their sin good, changing the parameters of God's justice, God's righteousness. Verse 21, verse 20, what well, are those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, wrote to those who are who are wise in their own opinions and clever in their own sight. Now this would be a, in addition to, or apart from God, not measuring their 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 um, um, opinions with God's word. Verse twenty-two. What well, are those who who are heroes at drinking wine, who are fearless at mixing beer, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent for justice. I'm going to extend kind of the, the idea of a bribe, not only just money, but also you doing things to gain favor for positions. Many of our politicians are doing that now. Okay, verse 24. Therefore, as the tongue of the fire consumes straw, and as the dry grass shrivels in the flames, so the roots will become like something rotten, and their blossoms will blow away like dust. For they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of hosts, and they have despised the word of the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. He, he raises his hand against them and struck them in the mountain quake. quake. And their courts were like garbage in the streets and all this his anger is not removed and his hand uh, and his ha and his hand is still raised strike he raises a signal flag for distant nations and whistles for them the end to the end of the earth look how quickly and swiftly they come none of them grows weary or stumbles no one slumbers or sleep nor uh, no belt is loose nor sandal strap broken. Their arrows are sharpened and all of their bows strong. For horses, uh, their horses' hooves are like flint and their chariot wheels are like whirlwinds. The warring is like a lion and their war like young lions. They growl and, and seize their prey and carry off and no one rescues them. On that day, they will war over it like a roaring, roaring of the sea. When one looks at the land, there will be darkness and distress. Light will be obscured, obscured by clouds. Now we're going to see this kind of language, this prophecy, um, repeated over and over and over again in our journey. So just uh, if I read through it quickly, that's why. Trust me, he's going to say this over and over and over again. Okay. Um, but it's kind of interesting. All right, guys, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you ever thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. I'll see you in the next study.